Hi guys, Chris from the Ultimate Recycler. Uh, welcome to part two. Actually, it's part three of my Australian Found Antique Bottles series, but this is part two of dating the bottles, uh, just to assist you with identifying the age of what you may have found. Um, now, dating, as I mentioned in the previous one, and I'll put a link up now to the first part I did on dating, which was earlier bottles in the 1800s through to about 1900. So that's at the top corner now. Uh, this section follows on from that being bottles from around the 1900s through to much more recent stuff in the uh, 60s and even into the 70s is becoming collectible now. So dating, as I mentioned in the first section, is a not an exact science. There's um, lots of variations and, and things to consider, exceptions to the rule, and uh, you've really just got to look at clues. So I'll go through these bottles and uh, give you as much information as I can whilst keeping it fairly simple. Uh, apologies if I'm a bit all over the place. I haven't scripted this. I'm just basically making it up as I go. Um, but to start around the 1900 era, um, undoubtedly the best era to collect old bottles. Um, Early 1800s stuff usually was plain and had labels, but once you get to the 1890s and into the 1900s through to the 1920s, they had uh, some beautifully embossed bottles. Um, they're real pieces of art, some of them, and they have a real appeal. Um, there's pictorial trademarks. There's, um, you know, the town names are boldly proclaimed. And uh, look at these little chutneys here white crow with the a crow and snake trademark um, so this era is certainly the most attractive and the most collected uh, and as I said it was from probably the 1890s through into the 1920s so we'll start with some of these as far as dating them goes and we'll look at colors for a start uh, I did mention in the earlier one that the earlier video that bottles that turn purple and these are sun-coloured purple bottles. Do so because from the 1890s they used a compound called mang manganese dioxide, which was a decolouring agent in the mix. And what that did was it got away from the natural greenish colour of glass, which was iron impurities. So um, it did react over time with UV light. And it gradually turns purple so you can date most purple glass to around about that era for the early 1900s through to 1920s um, but like i mentioned it's the science isn't exact um, some glass was recycled uh, generally speaking the practice stopped around world war one due to the problem of getting supplies out of germany however um, you know recycled glass was used some people might have had a supply that lasted longer so you can find purple glass right through to the 1930s but it does give you a guide uh, as i mentioned the greenish glass um, was from iron impurities and this aqua or greenish color was very common around the early 1900s and you can find it right through and even this bottle here is more of a 1950s and it still has that greenish tinge so that's not conclusive of age, but it certainly fits with um, with the older ones generally. Uh, clear glass, don't see much of it pre-1900, and as you get into the 20s, uh, this one's a 1920s one, and then 30s era, and you get much more clear glass uh, as the glass manufacturing process was refined through in the 50s and 60s. And generally looking at the glass itself, you do notice more uniformity in the later years. Uh, techniques got better, uh, manufacturing technology was better until you get through to the 60s and beyond where it's um, you know, uniform shape, nice and clear, uh, minimum bubbles. Uh, once machine making came in, the bottles had a lot less bubbles and inclusions in the glass. So you can see the progress. And if you look back at my earlier video, uh, on the 1800s bottles, um, there's a definite progression to uh, neater, more cleaner lines, more uniform, and uh, less contaminants, as you would expect as technology increased. So I'm just going to pick up a few and go through some things. Apologies if I forget stuff. 
this schnapps bottle is reminiscent of the earlier stuff it almost looks black but it is a darker green it's actually kind of an emerald green and uh, it has a, a very uniform base probably around 1900s that one um, the seams that run up the side disappear before you get to the top lip um, and that's indicative of a bottle that was made pre-machine total machine manufacturer the, the top was hand tooled earlier all these early ones these are around 1910 uh, so generally pre-1920s you'll find that the seam that runs up the side sometimes it's a bit hard to see this isn't a good example but it won't run through to the top lip we'll have a look at this one this one's easier to see so there you have it the seam stops before the top lip uh, and you would say then a good guide to being a pre nine uh, sorry a pre nineteen twenties bottle. Uh, these cordials, um, you'll see the same thing. This one's a good example in that it's actually dated. Rarely they date them, but some are dated. This one's dated nineteen twenty nine. Uh, the AGM is Australian Glass Manufacturers, and they use that symbol in nineteen twenties. But I will do a separate video on base marks. So we won't touch that too much. So in the 1920s they started to machine make bottles. And if you can see that, the seam does go right through to the top of the lip. So that's an early machine made bottle. Whereas this other cordial by the same manufacturer has the greener tinge so it looks a fraction older. It actually is dated as well, 1917. And if we look at the top on this one, um, I can't quite see the seam that runs up the side. But the top, you can see that the top's a bit uneven. It has actually been applied. So that's the era, 1920s through to the 30s, where they started making uh, bottles in, in more of a mechanised system. Uh, these chemists are another good example. The seam is quite visible on this chemist. But it does disappear in the neck, and the neck has a bit of a twist in it, as with the earlier bottles. Um, there is an early AGM mark on the base of that, which dates it around World War I era, so just before 1920s. And then this chemist is later, and it has a much later Australian glass manufacturer symbol, which puts it into the 30s, and you'll see the top on that one is um, the seam goes right through to the top lip. So the way the top lips are applied is important and around that 1920s era is when that changed. Uh, this fennel bottle has an early AGM mark for around the 1920s and the top shows quite obvious twisting marks where the seam disappears and doesn't go through to the top. So again, in that's 20s but before a fully manufactured, machine manufactured bottle, this one's much the same. Even though this has a, a different mark on the base, um, the manufacturer is very similar and I would put them both in the 1920s. So um, moving on then a bit, we've got crown seals which have been around since the 1890s. But as technology got better, they are much more refined. The seam goes right through the lip as well. So a definite machine made bottle. This one, you start to see the bases of more modern bottles have the stippling around the, the heel. Some of the marks are hard to see, but this is a, a later AGM mark, so that one's probably into the 50s, even though it still has a greener tinge. Um, and this one is a very clear little bottle, clear glass, but it has an older type base. Um, I would put that base back into the 20s maybe. It has an offset ring there, which is from the bottle manufacturing machine. I think that's called an Owens ring. But we'll do a separate video on bases and base marks. Cork top and the seam there is quite visible. goes right through to the very top. So even though it's probably a 20s base, I'd say it's possibly a 1930s bottle due to the top. So like I said earlier, um, dating isn't exact. You've got small glass manufacturers that used... May have, they may have purchased second-hand bottling machines that still made them the old way. Uh, larger companies could afford the latest technology. And so there's lots of crossovers in uh, 
in bottles. Uh, this blue castor oil bottle has an early top. Uh, it's actually a sheer top. It looks broken uh, and it's a bit chippy around the top but that's just the way it was finished. It was snapped off and that would have just been corked and possibly had a wax covering over it. Um, and that's early 1900s whereas the one next to it looks almost identical but it has a, a properly formed top and um, that dates it a little bit more recently. So uh, it's probably still 1920s that one. Uh, the pickles here, this is a scarce pickles, um, has another symbol there which is Australian glass manufacturers around about World War One era. Uh, the glass is typical of 20s or uh, you know, around that era. The top has been applied again so that ticks most of the boxes for that age bottle. Ginger beers were used from the late 1890s, the underglaze transferred ones through to around 1930. Uh, they were discontinued for uh, hygienic reasons I believe. You can see there's different tops there. They were made different different styles by different potteries and anyone experienced can, can usually pick a pottery from the glaze and the shape. Um, but ginger beer fell out of favour sort of into the mid 1900s and um, and the ginger beers after the 1930s were usually glass. Uh, likewise milk bottles can be dated from their change of uh, design. Uh, Pre-1950s they had these large tops that took a cardboard wad. So wide mouth milks are generally pre-1950s um, and they were discontinued I believe because uh, to open them generally you pressed the wad in, the cardboard wad which pretty much contaminated your milk with whatever dust the horse and cart churned up when delivering. And then into the 60s they, uh, they used a foil top which you'd peel off. Um, this has the stippling around the heel which is a much later uh, addition to bottle making. I have read that that helped with bottles um, on the conveyor line in the factories for filling and uh, also I read somewhere that it helped protect the thick glass base as it came out of the um, from being very hot and it, it's protected it from sitting on a cold conveyor uh, whatever the reason it's much more recent uh, and we flip over here to the crown seals um, into the 60s now and you can see the stippling around the base on those uh, that's also a modern Australian glass manufacturer symbol uh, these ceramic labels or pyro labels came in around the uh, Oh, probably 50s into the 60s. Uh, fluid ounces dates that 60s generally in Australia. Um, we did change to metric in 66, but the um, container industry really didn't change until into the 70s. So I generally use a date of about 1974. If you see a bottle that's in fluid ounces, you'd normally date it up to around 1970, early 70s. And then we went to metric, so... Um, Australia then you'll see bottles in mill of course if you find bottles from uh, Europe they were often in metric anyway and if you go to the States they're still in ounces uh, right we have uh, this is an internal thread bottle very clear glass uh, if we look at the seam up the top it goes through to the top there this is a, an in, as I said, an internal thread uh, the earlier ones were a real blob top and they were usually a greenish colour like these other bottles. Um, but this one's a very uniform squarish top so definitely machine made. Probably around 1950s this one and it would have had a label. So we got away from the beautiful in embossed bottles of the early 1900s. By the time you get into the 30s, 40s and 50s a lot of bottles had labels and you find a lot of clean skins. Um, so that's another reason why people tend not to collect the more modern stuff. Although what is becoming much more sought after are these pyros or ceramic labels. Um, partly due to local town history, a lot of people collect certain areas. Okay, what else do we have to touch on? Um, jars, here's a, a purple jar. So if we were to date this, I'd say, all right, it's purple. We're looking at perhaps 1920s or a bit earlier. Uh, we have an M on there for Melbourne Glassworks, which dates it a bit earlier than that, so I'd say probably around 1910. There are bubbles in the glass. It has a bit of a whittled effect. Nice bold embossing. So that ticks a lot of boxes 
as to early 1900s. So you can see it's a matter of putting all the clues together. This large jar has a Bakelite lid. It may or may not be the original lid for it. I don't think it is. If we look on the base, we can see large AGM letters for around 1920. And if I can zoom in on the edge on these jars, it's important. See that pitting around the edge? Sandblasting type effect. Jars were used and used and reused. So dating a jar, it's always important to look at the rim or the contact points because that indicates that it definitely has age and it's not a modern reproduction. Uh, there's a soda siphon here. Soda siphons into the uh, 1900s um, or more the fluted type. The earlier ones, I didn't bring one out, the earlier ones often had the, the planar sides. Uh, this has a plastic top too. The earlier ones had a, a chromed sort of die cast metal top. Um, here's a source. I don't think I mentioned this source. In fact, there's a couple of sources here. So this one is uh, nicely embossed again. The whittled glass, an earlier AGM symbol there. So that puts that around 1920 or just before. And the top. You can see I'm always looking at the top. It's one of the good indicators. Uh, has been applied. So, yep, around probably 1915 to 1920. This one has a screw top. Now, generally, screw top bottles are more recent. This is a, a coarser, earlier screw top. It has got the seam going right through the top. So it's a machine-made bottle. But if we look at the base... Oh, sorry about the code. I thought I took them all off. Uh, it does say AGM in straight letters there, which dates it around 1930 or back back into the 20s they stopped using those uh, AGM symbols in about 1934 so machine made but still it's close to the 20s era uh, and here's another one with a screw top generally speaking screw top bottles are going to be much more recent even though you do find some jars that are very early with screw tops um, this one's a typical 1950s um, bottle, even though it's got the greener colour of the earlier ones, a Bakelite lid fits on it. The symbols underneath indicate that it's certainly well after 1930s, so I'd put that one in the 50s. So, generally speaking, screw top bottles are um, and pretty much outside the collecting area unless they have really nice embossing or they have a connection with a local town. Um, I think that's all for now. Uh, as I said, I haven't scripted this. I've just been around these bottles trying to give you a, an idea on dating stuff from the 20th century. There's so many different shapes, sizes and different patents that it's impossible to cover it all. But that should give you a bit of an idea on what to look for with the types of glass. Um, the markings underneath, as I said, I'll do a separate video on base marks. And I'll do a separate video on the top in enclosures, the tops of bottles. Because that can give you an idea of um of age as well and the first thing i look at at a bottle if i haven't seen it before and don't recognize the shape is turn it over look at the base and then look at how the top's applied so thanks for watching look out for my next video i'll be doing a whole series on antique bottles uh, and i will specialize in each sort so i'll do some videos on particular patents uh, a lot of people are fascinated by these marble bottles or cod bottles so we'll touch on those as well. We'll touch on all the main collecting types over time. And hopefully I'll build up a good library of information to help beginner collectors. So um, thanks for watching. Look out for me in the next video.